I'm coming for your head! <laughs> <laughs> Come for you, Peter! You're a jump, Peter! <laughs> You're a jump! I'm coming for you! I'm coming to do what I should have done a long time ago! I'm coming! Peter. <coughs> Where is he? Hello everyone and welcome to my read along of The Eyes of the Dragon by Stephen King where I'll be reading and reacting to the major events of the book. This book is part of my journey to the Dark Tower so if you're a fan of the Dark Tower or of Stephen King in general then don't forget to subscribe. I'm excited to read this one. I actually know very little about it so um, let's dive in. Okay so straight away straight off the bat this this book uh, surprised me in, with some uh, familiar names. We've got Roland and we've got Randall Flagg, a.k.a. The Gunslinger and The Man in Black. I went into this book completely blind, so, you know, I, I wasn't expecting that at all. Another thing that really stands out to me is the writing style that Stephen King's using here is totally different to what he usually does. He'll normally go for magical realism, but this is pure fairy tale. It's something straight out of Camelot and the Knights of the Round Table. It even begins with Once Upon a Time. Listen, it, it's, it's blowing my mind that this character is called Roland. It, it cannot be Roland. Can it? it? It just cannot be Roland out of the gunslinger. I mean, it, it, it seems like it probably isn't, given the context of, of the scenario, given his general submissive demeanour. He's kind of the antithesis of, uh, of Ro the Roland that we know. Roland is the king and Randall Flagg is his advisor, but it's very clear that Randall Flagg is the one that's pulling the strings and the king is just his puppet. Roland marries Queen Sasha and it's a very popular match. Uh, you know, the whole kingdom just instantly fall in love with Sasha. Not only that, but her popularity serves as a kind of uh, challenge to the status quo. And uh, Randall Flagg don't like that. He, he don't like that. Randall Flagg sees her as a massive threat to his plans to overthrow and ultimately destroy the kingdom. He has her mortally wounded as she's given birth to her second son, Thomas, by the midwife. Dirty little butt. Thomas and Peter grow older without their mother and Thomas feels as though he's in the vast shadow of his older brother, Peter. I have to say, you know, I, I feel bad for Thomas. Just by the nature of being born second, in a royal family, it relegates you to being a backup. And there's this really tragic scene where Thomas carves a boat for his dad. And he's really hoping that this boat is going to impress his dad. You know, he really takes his time on it. Him and his dad have this kind of kinship together where they've gone fishing on a boat before. And he thinks, oh, he really like this. And then when he presents it to his dad, his dad likes it, you know, King Roland, oh, yeah, nice boat. But he's more interested in Peter and his, uh, his bowmanship. He's, is it bowmanship or marksmanship? Um, and he can only think about Peter. You know, Peter is the star of the show. It's very clear. It doesn't matter what Thomas does. There's no escape in this. And, and this scene, I think, really does a good job of establishing Thomas's motivations. I imagine what's going to happen is that he's probably going to turn on Peter um, and there's going to be some drama there. Maybe he'll challenge him for the throne or something somehow. But, um, you know, it's, it's clear the path that he's on. 
it's just it's just so tragic seeing someone you know th th this is this kind of life has been forced upon him in fact he's so messed up by the sibling rivalry that he stones a dog like that's how emotionally charged he feels he does this unforgivable disgusting thing and the narrator even says he's not a bad boy he's just doing bad things I mean, I, I would argue, if you're at the stage where you're stoning dogs, you might be a bad boy. But, you know, agree to disagree, narrator. Anyway, Randall Flagg sees this and he's, he's making a mental note, you know. Oh, I'll remember that. That might come in handy later, you know. I'll tell you what else isn't very convenient as far as Thomas is concerned, is how bloody impressive Peter is. I mean, just in the last few scenes that I've read here, uh, Peter is calm. He takes responsibility. He's able to connect with the working class, as we see in his three-legged race with um, uh, Ben Stutt. We see that he is tenacious and he's quietly confident. And above all, Peter is empathetic. We see this when he saves an injured horse that everyone else is just ready to put down and put out of his misery. He actually gives this horse a new use and, and it's just purely down to his empathy and down to his tenacity, not giving up. And Randall Flagg can see all of the qualities that were instilled in him as a young boy by his mother and it terrifies him. These types of qualities are like kryptonite to someone like Randall Flagg. He can see the type of man that Peter is going to become. And once he has power, he's not going to be able to manipulate someone like Peter the same way that he can his father. Whereas Thomas, on the other hand, you know, you know. Thomas is very clearly neglected by the people, by his father. Even though Peter, perfect Peter, keeps trying to bring him into the circle... It, it, it's not enough. He feels as though he's outside of the loop. Randall Flagg can see this. He knows that he's emotional. He see what he did to that dog. And so a plot starts to formulate in Randall Flagg's mind. Okay, so this is interesting. It, it's not until chapter 17 that we learn more about Randall Flagg. Although he's been in Delane for 70 years, it, it seems like he's only aged about 10 years. And people are freaking out. Not publicly, but they're starting to whisper amongst each other. Like, why is this guy not aging? What is going on? We also learned that this isn't the first time that Randall Flagg has been in Delane. He's been here many times throughout the years under different names. Each time he's wreaked havoc. Even still today, mothers will warn their children if they misbehave. Listen, you better start behaving or Bill Hinch is gonna come back and snatch you up. And Bill Hinch is one of the names that Randall Flagg uh, was under previously when he was in Delane centuries ago. And it, it, it's just, you know, it's difficult to know what Randall Flagg is because he can live for centuries. He can appear as different people. Randall Flagg's like a curse on this place that just won't go away. And it's difficult to know what type of creature he is, but whatever he is, he's not human. He can see the strength of Peter. He can see the weakness of Thomas. And he knows what he has to do. There's this strangely beautiful scene where Thomas sneaks into a secret room. And this room sits behind the eye of the dragon that his father slew uh, back in his youth. I love this scene. I don't, I don't know what it is. It's really nice. There's just something beautiful about a son watching his father through the eye of a dragon that he hunted when he was young and seeing him as he really is, not as this great, perfect man as he imagined him to be, but as just a human. <laughs> he's, he's picking his nose, he's blowing off, he's relieving himself into the fireplace. L listen to this. Thomas saw that his father, whom he had always loved and feared, who had seemed to him the greatest man in the world, often picked his nose when he was alone. He would root around in first one nostril and then the other until he got a plump green booger. He would regard these with solemn satisfaction, turning each one this way and that in the firelight, the way a jeweller might turn a particularly fine emerald. Most of these he would then rub under the chair in which he was sitting. 
Others, I regret to say, he popped into his mouth and munched with an expression of reflective enjoyment on his face. Disgusting, but, you know, very human. And rather than be repulsed, it makes Thomas realise that he can't hate his dad because his dad is just this silly little man. He's not perfect, he can make mistakes. And then he sees, through the eye of the dragon, uh, Randall Flagg bringing uh, his father the wine that will eventually be his poison. Yeah. Yeah, see, look. Um, okay, so <laughs> Judge Paynor is preparing to swear in Peter, and then he questions Peter about um, his, his dad's demise, and Peter bursts into tears. Um, pretty normal, pretty normal. You know, a lot of pressure, just about to become a king, uh, just about to, just lost his father, you know, pretty normal reaction, getting overwhelmed. Uh, also, a literal child, uh, so don't forget that. Paynor, what's his conclusion? You must have done it. Uh, what? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just so weird. It's just so weird when you're talking about the death of someone's father that they might cry. Yeah, what a crazy thing to do. Paynor, give your head a wobble, mate. It's annoying because everything's going to plan for Randall Flagg, you know? <sighs> Peter asks Paynor, well, what am I supposed to do? You know, do I st am I still supposed to become the king? Am I supposed to step down? Like, what do, you, what do you want me to do? And I actually like how matter-of-fact Paynor is in this scene. He says... Well, you're under investigation for murder. Um, we want you to step down as king. You don't have to step down as king, but if you don't, then I'll basically start my life over somewhere else and uh, there'll probably be a civil war. So what do you want to do? You want to you do that or you want to step down? Up to you. <laughs> Peter is found guilty. And given, you know, given the evidence uh, that comes out, you can't really blame anyone for thinking that he might be guilty. All of the people of the whole kingdom think he's guilty as well. Ugh, man. Randall Flagg, he, he doesn't miss a trick. He's in there like a rat up a drain pipe. He positions himself as Thomas's only ally. Remember, this is a kid that has been neglected by everyone his whole life, except for Randall Flagg. And he does, just by using a little bit of very simple reverse psychology, he is able to get Thomas practically begging him to take all of his power away. He's like, they want to make me king. You have to stay. You can make all the decisions. I'll just give you all the power. And then Randall Flagg's like, well, oh, yeah, all right, fine. I will stay and I will run everything. As a personal favor to you, there's a saying that if I say something, I could be lying, but if I get you to say it, then you know it's the truth. And that's exactly what Randall Flagg has done to Thomas here. And listen, I have to say, I have a begrudging respect for Randall Flagg in this situation. With just a few sneaky tactics, he's been able to carve his path in this world. It's annoying how good he is at this. I mean, think about it. He's taken out his mother. He's taken out his father. He's imprisoned his brother. And he's basically destroyed his whole family. It's evil, but it's clever. And you've got to give him that. It's, in the next scene, it's kind of amazing to see how quickly Thomas has been seduced by power. And I think it's easy to see why he would be seduced by power as well. His whole life, he's lived in the shadow of his perfect older brother. And now, here he is, the king. Everyone's chanting his name, while his perfect little brother is up there in the tower looking down on him. Now look at me, look at me now, Peter. Look at me now. <laughs> like you thought, you thought you were better than me in every way and you were, but now it's my turn to get that sun on my face. You know, oh, I'm getting that, I'm getting that vitamin D and it feels good. And as Thomas is 
having his kind of petty pseudo revenge on his brother that was always good to him, by the way. Um, Peter is imprisoned up in the tower and he's reminding himself in typical Peter fashion not to feel self-pity. This, this kid is so perfect, man. Then he just starts to make his plan for his very unlikely escape. <laughs> Okay, okay. So the first part of his plan, it seems like, is to lure one of the guards into a fistfight with him. And it turns out, Peter is basically Floyd Mayweather. This is such a hilarious twist. You know, he's got the moves, man. He's like, he's bobbing, he's weaving. You know, I mean, I'm not being funny. He absolutely batters this guy. He batters this guard. I don't even think the guard lands a punch. And, uh, I mean, this guard is completely humbled. He tells the guard, listen, go and take this message to Paynor. And then he takes a message to Paynor, and then Paynor relays that message to Ben Stard, his old friend from the three-legged race, right? His, uh, his, his old buddy. I really like... Ben Stard's family, you know, they're, they're, they're real salt of the earth, they're working class people, um, and they stumbled in to some good luck by Ben befriending um, Peter, but then it's all, been, it's all been taken away from them. As a special request, um, ben is allowed to go and visit Peter in his cell and uh, <clears throat> Peter's requested that he brings him his doll, doll's house for some reason. Don't know why. Um, <laughs> it seems a bit unusual. Um, but uh, I'm sure he's got a plan in mind. Oh, perfect Peter, you know. But there's this really nice moment where Ben says, listen, I know you might feel alone in these four walls, but just remember that a lot of people still believe in you and I'm one of them and you're my friend, and you still have friends, and you're not as alone as you might feel like you are. I like Ben, you know? I'm like, I like Ben, he's a good bloke. Okay, so it seems like the plan is that he's going to, what Peter's gonna do, he's got a five year plan, right? He's gonna cut little slithers of the napkins to get brought up to him, and he's gonna thread them together, and he's gonna basically create a rope over the course of five years, and He's going to climb out the window with it. Seems unlikely. Seems like a really long-term plan. But, you know, five years? Is it within the realms of possibility that you can do it? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say yes. And uh, it kind of reminds me a little bit of another Stephen King story, a short story, um, a Shawshank Redemption, right? Uh, if, if, you, if you haven't seen that by now... It's your fault, to be honest. That's your fault. That's on you if you haven't seen that by now. But there's there's a uh, there's there's something that's similar to that. Meanwhile, things in the kingdom are <laughs> not that good. Um, Thomas has made a decision to increase taxes to eighty percent. Eighty percent. It's like he's just begging for the guillotine. It's bloody Randall Flagg, isn't it? It's Randall Flagg in his ear. Speaking of Randall Flagg, um, Peter finds in his cell a little locket. Um, and it's from a previous cell tenant from 400 years ago. And they were also framed for murder by Randall Flagg. He's done this before. But more interesting than the fact that he's done this before and you implemented this strategy before, 400 years. This is when Peter realizes that Randall Flagg isn't just some evil man, he is a creature. And then we learn some more interesting things about Randall Flagg. We learn that he can actually hear when people think his name and that the table next to his reading chair is dressed in human skin. I mean, this this is not a uh, normal person. There's a few scenes where Peter exchanges notes with people that are still loyal to him. Peter finds a note hidden in some napkins that are delivered to him. And he decides that he's going to write back. And so he actually doesn't have any ink, obviously. So the only thing that he has to use as ink is his own blood. 
So naturally, what he's probably going to do, quite painless, he'll just prick his finger and then write his note. Nope. Nope. Eh, hey, come here, come here. Nope. He's not going to do that. What, prick his finger? That's too easy. You know what he's going to do? He's going to get a sharp stick and he's going to run it across his wrist. Because he's dramatic. Like, calm down. You don't need to, you don't need to do that. Do that. Randall Flagg starts to become aware through dreams and visions that Peter's planning an escape attempt. And he rushes towards the tower just as Peter is about to escape through the window. And he runs up to the tower and he's banging on the door. Open up in the name of the king. Finally, a guard reaches the door. He opens the door and whoosh, he splits his head with an axe. More drama. Everyone's so dramatic. And then he screams out, let this be a lesson to you. Open up the door more quickly if you don't want to clean up a mess in the morning. Is that the lesson? I don't think that's the lesson. If I was a guardsman, the lesson I would take from that is if Randall Flagg is knocking on the door, don't be the first one to answer it unless you want your head split like a coconut. Anyway, Randall Flagg is inside. Peter's panicking and Randall Flagg is just screaming out, you know, here I come, Peter. I'm coming to do what I should have done a long, long time ago. Actually, why, why didn't he? This is one of the problems that I have with the story. Randall Flagg is a scheming little snake and he had this kid locked up in a tower for five years. And not only that, but everyone hated him. Everyone thought he was guilty. And he had the ear of his brother that was jealous of him. He could have gotten Thomas to execute him. And in fact, that would have been really cool, I think, if there would have been some scenes maybe where Randall Flagg is spitting poison into Thomas's ear, trying to get him to take out his brother, but Thomas is like trying to resist it. It's the one thing that he won't do is physically harm his own brother, you know? Having that kind of character arc, that redemptive character arc that Thomas could have had. But that is, is not what's happening. Randall Flagg is running up to the tower and he's got himself an axe. With every few steps that he takes, he shouts up, Peter, here I come. Peter uh, starts to lower himself out of the window. Listen, th this, is, this is the culmination of five years of slow and steady methodical work. It's genuinely a tense scene. You know, you really feel as though these napkins can snap at any moment. Flag sees the thinness of the rope and he knows that that rope will break. And he's right. But what he doesn't realize is that the friends of Peter have actually laid down a kind of mattress of napkins for him to fall onto. Um, I tell you what, these napkins are really coming in handy. These, these, I mean, this is like, this is like pro napkin propaganda. <laughs> Peter lands on the napkins. Yay, napkins. And he and his friends run off into the woods. They're stopped by a platoon led by a man named Galen. And the way that I'm imagining Galen is uh, he's like the pimply faced teen from The Simpsons, but only wearing armor. Stop in the name of the king. Peter stares them down and he assures them that he is the king. And they sort of take his word for it. <laughs> Randall Flagg bursts out of the tower doors and everyone runs away, including the wimpy soldiers. The group all sprint back to old King Roland's chambers where Peter plans to have his final standoff with Randall Flagg. Flagg confesses to the crime of taking King Roland's life and, you know, he thinks, I might as well tell everyone, everyone in this room is going to be gone shortly anyway. But what he doesn't realise is that Thomas is also in the room and he can hear everything that Randall Flagg has been saying. Thomas, in this moment, looks so much like his father that Randall Flagg thinks that it's the ghost of Roland. And so he charges at him and Thomas draws his father's bow and arrow 
and aims it up at Nina, the dragon that his father slayed. And smacks it right into the eye of the dragon. Randall Flagg disappears before their eyes. Which, if you've read much Stephen King, this is something that Randall Flagg likes to do quite often. Peter returns to the throne and he rules well. Ben and Naomi get married and uh, Thomas and Dennis go off to hunt down Randall Flagg. Um, I have to say, that is a little bit of a wet fart of an ending. Listen, I'll say this about the book. I definitely didn't hate it. I enjoyed seeing Randall Flagg again. Flagg is a character who is just endlessly fascinating to me and seeing him reincarnated in different times, in different places, it's, it's always a pleasure. With that said, this book is my, my least favorite of Stephen King that I've ever read. Um, sorry. Speaking of which, if you wasn't aware, this is actually book four in my extended Journey to the Dark Tower series. And if you'd like to join me on the next stop in that journey, where I'll be reading and reacting to The Talisman, then you can click up here. So hopefully I enjoy this a little bit more than the last one. Come on. See you in the next one.